Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. How are you, Sheikh Estes? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. How are you, Eddie? Good, Alhamdulillah. It's I'm nice to be with you again after all this long intermission. It seems like forever. It's been a while, but I'm very excited that you're back here on the Dean Show. Yeah, it's nice to be with you. As we introduce you in the opening, this is uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes, who has his own section at thedeanshow.com. He's the founder, president of Guide Us TV. Oh, yeah. Here in America. And it's viewed in Canada and the U.S. And you can catch it at guideustv.com. Yeah, that, of course, that'll go all over the world if you go that route. Yeah. But uh, for, as far as the satellites go, we do have Canada, the United States, both of us. MashaAllah. We're going to be talking about today, you know, one of the most important topics, important things in our life is establishing a relationship with the one who created us, uh -huh. trying to live that life that's pleasing to the Creator. But many of us, we get caught up into, into the day-to-day -day activities. So we want to give our viewing audience and the audience that's here some tips on how we can go away from making the conversation just baseball, basketball. Many people don't feel they are qualified to talk about Islam, but, and they feel that, how can I break the ice? Yeah. Or it, they, some feel that's not an obligation to open their mouth and to invite people to have a relationship with the one who created them. So let's talk about that point. How can we break the ice and get people a little motivated to open up a conversation and to invite them to what will give them peace? Islam. Well, naturally, the first thing I always look at, and as you well know, is the etymology of words. Because the more I understand the words, the more I understand what people are trying to tell me. In Islam, we do have something that's more than just a relationship with Almighty Allah. We have something called the connection. In the Arabic language, there's the word silla. Silla means to connect to something. And we have from that the word salah. And Salah, obviously, is our connection with Allah that we make five times a day. But when we talk about our connection with the people, our relationship with the people, then we have another subject, and this is our Dawah. And Dawah, this is related to another word, Dua. And Dua is to call on Allah, and Dua is what we do all the time, or what people call pray. So Silla is connection with Allah, but Dua is calling upon Allah. Now let's bring it to the subject of the people. The Dawa calling the people to the way of Allah to call them back to the worship of the one God, which you're always talking about in every show. I never heard you open any show except you always mention the creation, the creator, the relationship. It's always, you set that as the format for every show you've ever done, I think. I, don't, I didn't miss any, but I, I think that I've seen that in every single show. So people should know just when they opened up the program and started watching, you're serious, you're talking about one God, worship Him on His terms. Well, essentially that is what we're always trying to do. But how can we help our brothers and sisters have a better understanding? And you already mentioned that a lot of times we're kind of nervous with the people, we don't know where to go, they're not Muslim, we don't know what to say. Uh, how's the weather? Weather's nice. Well, it's kind of cold, it's windy, it's who cares? You know, I'm not a weatherman. <laughs> what I'm talking about that. Well, how about the big game? Okay, well, let's talk about the game, and that was a three-point spread. And was it, Wait a minute, I'm not a sportscaster either, you know? So why am I getting into these subjects? And usually it's because people are nervous when they meet each other and they want to find a common ground. So I like the idea, again, going back to the Dean Show, the things that are stressed again and again, that our common ground is to go to the subject of the Creator. And there is only one Creator. He created everything. Now, whether they're a Hindu, or a Buddhist, a Jew, a Christian, or even some Muslims that kind of strayed far away, you know, they still know there's a creator, there's something behind everything that happened. But if a guy gets hung up on that and he doesn't want to go forward, then what do you do? You know, he's, there's a, quite a bit of atheism now because so many people are seeing the fallacies of these made up religions. And so they assume that all religions are the same. So there are a number of issues that people can pick up on. For instance, um, I was talking with some of our brothers the other day, and I said that, you know, if we do the etymology of words and look at words, they give you something to talk about. For instance, somebody said he's from Palestine. And I said to him, why do you say Palestine? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know and I know in Arabic it's called Philistine. And in the Bible it's called Philistine. Who came up with this word Palestine? So why don't you use the word that you know, that it, what we say in Arabic? 
He said, well, then people won't know. I said, no, they'll, you know, they'll learn real quick. If they say, where is that? Look at the opportunity. If you said, I'm from Philistine, this is just an example. But then he says, oh, wow, where is that? <laughs> well, it's in the Bible. That's where it is. You know about the Philistines? Uh, not exactly sure. Do you remember when David threw the rock and killed Goliath? He was the Philistine. And after that, what happened? So you have to realize that the Philistines lost the battle to who? The followers of David. And what was the religion of David? Ah, now you get to open up the subject. The same would be true if you want to go to the New Testament. For instance, if somebody's talking about Jerusalem, Again, that's Philistine, right? But Jerusalem, what is Jerusalem? Etymology of the word. jar ru salam Later they pronounced it, this word salam as shalom, but originally even the Jewish pronounced it salam. jar ru salam And what is that? Well, in Arabic you say dar. In the old Hebrew they said jar, dar salam What is that? Place of peace. So if you think about it, oh, by the way, we have schools and masajid, mosques in the United States called Dar es Salaam, place of peace. So if you said Jar es Salaam, and they're going, what's that? That's Jerusalem. You believe in Jerusalem? Well, yeah, okay, there you are, a place of peace. Of course, it's been anything but that for the past many centuries, but this is beside the point. The point that we're trying to stress is a commonality that we can come to, that we can talk about, so people can see and understand where we're coming from. Because once we establish Jerusalem, Jerusalem, place of peace, this is where who lived. Did Jesus live there? Ah. Oh. And after Jesus, what religion did those people follow? Because some of them continued to follow Judaism, as was understood by Moses. But at that stage, they are Jewish no longer believing correctly because Jesus has come with the message to clarify, and they didn't accept it. Average Christian will say, that's right. So those people are no longer on the right religion. Likewise, at the time of Moses, when Moses came, salam, and he talked to his people, they were all the sons and daughters of who? Abraham. So the followers of the Abrahamic faith, when Moses came, he clarified and brought clear commandments for them. And if you didn't follow those, then you're not a follower of the true religion anymore. Then if you come to Jesus and you said, okay, Anybody not following Jesus now? It doesn't matter what he believed about David or Moses or Abraham. It's Jesus in front of you. You don't believe him, then where are you? And likewise, the last and the final messenger from this same Abrahamic chain through Ishmael, who is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever knows about this message of the unity of God, the oneness of Almighty Allah, and they want to worship him on his terms, following his commandments, obeying him, then they need to be a follower of all of these prophets and always ending with the last prophet, in this case, would be Muhammad. Give us some tips. You're in a plane, a train, or an automobile, and you have a few minutes. You've got to break the ice, and you want to go ahead and leave them with something to think about, to contemplate about the purpose of life. How, in your experience, have you did it and give us and our viewing audience some of these secret tips. I don't know if it's a secret tip. I think it's a forgotten tip. A forgotten tip. Yeah, I do. I believe it's a forgotten tip because everything from the Prophet Islam is not a secret. We're just kind of dumb. We don't pay attention. <laughs> but here's a tip. Before I get in the airplane, before I get in the bus, before I'm in the public talking with the people, I've already done my work, my homework, really literally homework. What's my homework? At home, at night, in the middle of the night, get up. Get out of bed. Make wudu. If you have trouble getting up in the night, just drink a bunch of water before you go to sleep. <laughs> Oops. And you'll get up. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Our studio audience is laughing, but you know, it will work. You get up, and then after you make your wudu, face the Qibla, and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rakatain. Two rakah. And then one by itself, which is called witch. And then when your head's on the ground, just cry to Allah and ask Him, let me share this message the way you want it shared with the people. Help me, Allah. Help me. And I guarantee it has happened to me every single time something good happened to me the very next day. Some way or another, I benefited 
somebody else benefited, but together mutually, everybody benefits. Now, when somebody comes to me, I used to be looking for these secret tips, okay? Which, as I just said, there's no such thing. But in that, I would think, well, I'll say this, I'll say that, okay? Uh, sir, did you know that if you don't believe, uh, you're gonna go to hell or, you know, that sound like the old Christian sales pitch. Do you believe in Jesus? You know, you don't believe in Jesus. All right, okay. Well, we don't really have that. In fact, I've seen it happen that I sit down in the airplane and I'm just looking through something that they got there and somebody will tap me and say, excuse me, how come you're wearing that thing on your hair? Are you Jewish? One time a lady in the security line, you know when you go through for the, the so-called security check? Mm -hmm. I call it insecurity because everybody feels insecure. <laughs> but as you're going through this thing, you know, Here's this lady, old lady, she looks at me, she sees how I'm dressed, she goes, um, um, uh, what are you? Poor little old lady, she's scared, you know? I said, I'm a chaplain. Oh, okay. We went a little further in the line, she turned around, she said, what's a chaplain? As long as I wasn't a Muslim, she was okay. <laughs> but when people begin to open up and say something to me, that's when I really want to be prepared. I don't think that it's a really a big benefit to, to talk about the ways to open a conversation, just like to walk up to somebody and say, by the way, did you know that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States? I mean, that could add to their phobia that they already have. Mm -hmm. And you might even find them coming back at some weird things and you wouldn't be prepared for it. So if they see you as a Muslim or suspect you might be one of those, at least it gives you a place to open up. I use the words because, of course, English was my uh, forte. I spent a lot of time studying English language, and I enjoy that, uh, I, any language, really, whether it's Spanish, Arabic, English. But when we come to the subject of the person themselves, then I look at the person as though, I, from them, I gotta get it from them. I need to know, it, when I do a Juma khutbah, for instance, a lot of times they'll ask me, What's the Juma Khutbah going to be about? I say about 20 minutes. By the way, if you laugh a little louder, you don't have microphones that we do. Anyway, <laughs> we don't often have a studio audience. But uh, anyway, to come back to that, when I look at the, the people in the Juma and the Masjid, and I'm, I'm thinking, what is today's topic? Well, if I look and they're all Arabs, it's going to have to have a lot of Arabic in it. But when I'm looking at their old youth, I need to think in terms of what they're interested in. I need to bring it down to where we can all be on a common ground. And that's the same thing. If you're talking to a housewife uh, about space travel or something, she'd be like, huh? And it, it, at the same time, you're talking about a guy that's a computer geek. He wants to talk about megabytes. He wants to talk about, you know, how much uh, RAM that you get, and different things like that. So put it in perspective. You've got to think who you're talking to. And sometimes you don't need to be a conversationalist. You don't need to be a lecturer. All you need to do is have some basic knowledge, answer a few questions. How come you Muslims have to kill all the Jews and Christians? Well, I don't really think we have to because I never heard anybody tell me that. Well, I saw on TV, I saw on the Internet, my pastor said, well, you know, it's a good thing that God led you to somebody that lives that life because we really don't. Now, I'm not calling your pastor a liar, and I'm not saying that media would prevaricate, and I'm not trying to indicate to you that the Internet's not the best place to get information, <clears throat> but, as a matter of fact, we Muslims are ordered to be the best to the Jews and Christians, so that's uh, really the opposite of what you heard. And in fact, Allah said in the Quran, the Jews and the Christians from them are the closest to us in belief, and certainly we give the highest respect to everybody, but especially those who are closest to us in belief. A couple more questions before we come to a close. Tell us, Sheikh, Dawah, given the invitation to the purpose of life, is this something that is restricted to the Imams, to the people of knowledge, or is this an obligation for every Muslim? Well, I want to give credit to our Imams and our teachers of Islam and mention that it's their responsibility to teach us how to do the Dawah. No doubt. And to give us some evidence and proofs for what it is we're doing in the dawah. They should be active with us in helping us in sharing the message. But then after that, we each and every one of us are responsible to do whatever it is that we know. 
Our Prophet Sallallahu said this in a way that is very clear. He said, convey from me, even if it's only one ayah. And with that, I mentioned a couple of things. You might be surprised to know that. One ayah. No, we're going to talk about one verse of the Quran, right? One. Is there a single Muslim you know that doesn't know Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Every single Muslim knows Bismillah. Is that right, guys? Yeah, don't nod your head. The TV can't see you. What did you say? Yes. All right. Now, Bismillah means in the name of Allah, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the gracious, the most merciful, etc. So if you know that, convey that. And you might say, well, I don't know what that's going to mean. Watch. In Baltimore, Maryland, a couple years back in Ramadan, I met a brother there who told me he came to Islam from that. I said, what? He said, okay, I was a Christian. Fourteen years ago, I became a Jew. Or uh, that didn't impress me yet. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, you went backward. He said, no, because in Christianity, there were too many controversies. There's too much contrast between Old Testament, New Testament, and too many things. He said, so I went and to the Jewish and became a Jew, studied it, learned Hebrew. With the Hebrew and the experience with the rabbis, he came to know that it was unknown to them what God's name really was, and you're not supposed to even attempt to pronounce the tetronomogram, which I hope I pronounced it right, but what that represents is the actual name of God. And even the rabbis that I know will never pronounce it. And even one time I said, is it Allah? They said, we're not allowed to even speculate. We won't even say that. And they refused to say Allah, by the way. So he argued with them. He says, 14 years he's put into this thing, talking about, they said, we don't really know what's the name of God. And he's thinking, how can I be in a religion believing in a God that we don't even know the name of? Until one day, some brothers playing, playing sports had put their Quran down on a bench somewhere, and he looked down on it, and he, and he said, hey guys, what's this? And they come over, what are you talking about? He said, right there, in English, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. He said, do you know who's, what's God's name? Is that what this means? And they said, yeah, everybody knows it's Allah. He said, what? It says in the name of God, what's God's name? He said, well, in Arabic it says, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, we translate it as God. He said, his name is Allah? They said, yeah. You know that? Yeah. It comes from Allah. And that's a God. But Allah, it means the one and only God. That's his actual name. That's one of the Asma wa Safa of Allah. They begin talking about the Asma wa Safa of Allah. His names, his characteristics, his attributes. He is the epitome, for instance, of sabr, which is the ultimate um, patience or persevering. He is as-salam. He is the peace. From him comes peace. There is no peace that except that it has to come from the peace. He is the peace. The more they talk about their brothers, just stand there going, Oh. Muhammad He entered Islam with that. And when I met him, he said, I'm learning Arabic now. I want to be a Muslim. My wife, who also converted to Judaism, has now converted with him over to Islam. Their children now are in Islam, and they're doing great. That's from one ayah. Another ayah, right after that. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. How many people know Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen? Huh? I met a guy who came to Islam from this ayah. And how that came about? Well, he was talking with some of his friends. He'd known them for a long time. They, he said they weren't even good Muslims. They don't even, you know, many things he said about them. But the bottom line... He also saw something in a book that somebody had, and it says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and in English translation it says, all the praise is due to the Lord of the worlds, with an S. Why do I emphasize it? He said that all of his life, he said if there really was a God, he left Christianity, he said because they have no provision for anything outside of some God that's the God of Abraham and Moses, but what about being the God of the entire earth. What about being the God of the moon and the God of the sun and the God... And they don't have any answers. They said, oh, that's uh, fake worship, that's uh, uh, polytheism, idolatry, don't mention the moon, don't mention the stars. 
So when he sees this and he's asking a brother about it, he said, worlds? And they said, yeah, Allah is the Lord of the worlds. Any life that's there, regardless if it's on earth or in outer space, and people that we don't see, he said, people we don't see, what are you talking about? He said, the jinn. He started explaining about the jinn. The guy's like, you believe it? He said, yeah, of course. He said, I've always wondered if there was even another level of people or beings or, or ghosts or some kind of demons or something. And they said, yeah, we know all about it in Islam. He said, oh my God. And this provides what? He said, yeah, he said, Ashadu la ilaha illallah, Sallam Muhammad Rasulullah. He said that brought him to Islam. And then he studied and learned a lot more about the details of the jinn and the things they do, the difference between angels and jinn, the devil is not an angel, etc. Things that there's a lot of evidence for and common sense. And he said, I'm the happiest guy in the world because of that one verse. So again, we'll go back to what Rasul Sallam said, convey it from me even if it's a single verse. In the last couple of minutes that we have, we're about to close for those of our brothers in humanity who are tuning in for the first time and they like what we're talking about and they're also confused in the chaos that's out there and they want to know the truth. In the last few minutes that we have, can you express to them what is the call, what is the invitation to? Well, the invitation, of course, is to To your worship. house for dinner? Well, uh, well, let's go to your house for dinner. <laughs> We're in Chicago, and uh, you're the likely one to be the host here. Let's do this. When I'm wrapping things up with people, you said it, right. We only got a few minutes with somebody, and then they're gone. Oh, and I wanted to say this. I wanted to say that. Why didn't I? Oh, man, I forgot this. I forgot to tell them. Oh, oh, oh. This is why we developed websites. I have 2,200 websites for Islam, and they're very simple to deal with. Most of them, it's easy to memorize because they're, they are what it says. For instance, Just Ask Islam is where you can ask questions. Search for Islam, that's where you can search for the topic you want. And these are all dot coms. Another one that you can go to, very simple, you want to know about God, Allah? Even if you forget my website, just put God space Allah in Google and it'll be the first one pop up. All the rest of them, by the way, are going to attack Islam. But at least you'll remember ours is GodAllah.com. After that, ProfitOfIslam.com. Science Islam, that's for the atheists.com. And then when you get all done with this long list, Islamswomen.com, about jihad.com, links to Islam.com, etc., etc. And you say, oh, I should have wrote them all down. Well, the last one I said is the only one you really need to know. Links to Islam.com. And you can find these links and go over it because. What we're going to say on your show, there'll be a few highlights, but nobody remembers everything. I won't even remember it tomorrow, what all the details you, we, you and I just talked about. But if I have a reference point, and I think that's more important than trying to be a great speaker or articulate in what I'm talking about, just let them have their own reference point. On their own, they go to the internet, they type in something when they're comfortable, relaxed in their home, and they can sit there, take their time, drink their coffee, answer their phone, and it's right in front of them, and they say, you know what, that's what I believe. This is what it's all about. I, too, want to join this, and I want to worship my Creator on His terms, His way, and I want to be one of those guys that does it. And, of course, we know that's la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The person who's not that tech savvy, we just have, I want to really take advantage of the last couple, minute almost that we have, the person that is not tech savvy, they don't use the Internet, and we got their attention. What advice do you give them? I'd ask them, where did you see the Dean Show? It's on the internet. Hello? They're at, they're at somebody's house. Someone brought, oh, okay. them, Muslim brought them over. They were drinking some tea, eating some biryani, and now <laughs> we, we, we got, <laughs> they might never tune back. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you got me, Eddie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if if they know how to turn on a TV set, they can watch us on satellite on Guide US TV. If they don't know how to turn a TV set, ask an eight-year-old to come turn the computer on because they all know how to do that. And go to the Dean Show. The put the word the in front. T H E Dean Show dot com, or put in GuideUS.TV and watch us there. Thank you, Shay. Thank you so much for being with Back us. May God Almighty, the Creator, Allah reward you. And you. Okay. We'll be right back.
back. When it's close to death, they say, oh God, don't let me die. Um, but he's got something better than this world. What's God going to get out of punishing you anyway? We have to connect to this understanding that the Quran is from God, that Muhammad is his messenger, and the answers to the problems in our life are there. And if we're going to worship something, I figured I might as well worship the Creator instead of any of the creations. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lie is by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lie is by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone If a lie's by my side I am not afraid to stand alone We're taking some questions from our live studio audience and the sister who asked the question, what are the things to emphasize about Islam when you only have a little bit of time, Shay? One of the first things that I try to remember is that Tawheed, the oneness of God, is the thing that all the scholars told us to work on that. Don't get into a lot of other things. Like somebody might even say, like, why do you cut off people's hands? Well, I never cut anybody's hand off in my life. I've never even seen it done. I don't even know what that's all about, really. Because they say, well, I read on the Internet you chop off people's hands. Well, i got both hands. Everybody I know has got both hands. So I don't know. <laughs> what if you're a thief? You, they cut off your hand. I said, well... You know, the only person should worry about that's a thief. Are you a thief? <laughs> What's your problem? So then they start laughing and think about it, you know. And then, but we'll go to this. You see, the same creator of the heavens and the earth has sent a message to the people again and again and again. And people play with it, corrupt it, do things to it. So that's why more messengers come to more people. Because God never punishes the people unless he sent a messenger to them. And the message is always the same. Worship God without partners no images, no idols. Don't try to represent God with anything that exists in the creation because he is the creator. Simple as that. Here on the Dean Show with President Sheikh Yusuf Esther, the man formerly... <laughs> Not president. <laughs> <laughs> president of Guide Us TV. For, former man of the cloth. Do you call it man of the cloth? No, 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 no. Preacher, no, no, minister. No, no. <laughs> Islam way back. And we are taking questions from our live studio audience. And the question is about the Dijal. Well, first of all, I don't say man of the cloth because I really wasn't a pastor of a church. The most, the closest I came was when I was a music minister. But preaching the word was always something near and dear to me. I used to carry my Bible everywhere I went and put it into practice, not just on Sunday, but if I pick up a stranger or give him a ride or something, I want to uh, preach to him. By the way, that's the same thing Abu Didat used to do as a Muslim. Did you know that? Mm. Yeah, a lot of people that they're at IPCI in Africa right now they originally got to Islam through him giving them a ride. MashaAllah, that gives you an idea. You can help people out along the way and then tell them about Islam. But anyway, to come back to this uh, subject now, that as far as the Dajjal is concerned, this is what we call the Antichrist. Dajjal, he is the liar. He is Messiah Dajjal, which is the false Christ. Messiah is like Messiah or Christ. And Messiah Dajjal, he is clearly mentioned in Hadith. So, sister, what you want to do is go to search for Islam, type in either Antichrist or Dajjal with two J's, and then it will bring you all of this. But for sure, he will look like a human, he will talk like a human, he has human features. The unusual characteristics about him are basically his eyes. He has one eye that's a bulb, it's a, like, a, like a grape. Another eye, he's blind in it totally. He sees out of one eye and he doesn't see out of the other eye. And that's, that's very clear. But he will do miracles and make people think he's Jesus come back again. That's why he's called Messiah Dajjal. So it's not the television. Some people said it's the one-eyed God. But I heard that from the Christians in the 1950s. Do you believe it or not? They were saying, that's the Dijal right there, or the uh, Antichrist, because it brings so much trash and garbage in our house. Not like now when it's only nice stuff that we have on TV. <clears throat> anyway, 
to uh, other signs that you can find out about this. Uh, there will be great trials and tribulations that will be taking place, and it is not yet. That has not come. Somebody said that Jesus is back on earth walking around hiding so that the people won't kill him. That's also not true. It's clear in Hadith that he will come with angels to angels and he will come down from heaven and he will land in a place in Damascus, Syria. That's where he will be and it will be time for the Salah. So these things have not happened. I don't care what other things they try to relate to it, political scenes, economic problems, uh, technology and all the rest of it. It's not true. It's as simple as that. Your common sense. If you read the Hadith, this is not right. Continue with the question about the Imam Mahdi. The Imam Mahdi. A lot of people ask about that. Well, again, this is from Hadith. This is not mentioned in Quran, so you have to know Hadith. You go to the Hadith and find out. You can go to our website, searchforislam.com, type in Mahdi. Spell it M-A-H-D-I, Mahdi, and then you'll find out about it. Now, what we know is the Prophet ﷺ told us that the Mahdi will come. He will come before Isa salam comes. The fact that he has not come yet is clear proof that Jesus is not on earth walking around, even though some big famous person said it. I'm not going to say his name because, you know, we love him for the sake of Allah. We hope Allah guide him. But in any case, coming back to the subject of the Mahdi, he is going to be Imam Mahdi. That's true. And he's not going to have magical powers, anything like that. He does not know he's the Mahdi until he is the Mahdi. You got that? He's not going to be walking around as a kid saying, I'm the Mahdi. That also, you saw it on YouTube maybe, with some people of a different sect of Islam. I'm not going to say what, but they came up with this idea. It's not true. Because the Hadith is very clear that when he comes, his name is going to be a clue for you. His name is going to be Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. He said his name will be my name and his father's name will be my father's name. That is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. And for sure, that is one clue. But then the other thing is, he has to be from the progeny of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And there is no progeny coming from the Prophet Sallallahu except by Fatima and Ali. So he has to be coming from Fatima and Ali. So there's, this would be obvious. Okay? And he would be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Uh, along the way... You can see that if you study some of the various sects of Islam, you can see why some people believe we are this and we're that and this and that, and that's where the mistakes start coming in. But for sure, it will all, if you live long enough, you'll see that happen. We don't know when it's going to be, and you're not supposed to know when it's going to be. But it will come soon enough. There was somebody asked the Prophet ﷺ about these last days. When will they come? He said, what do you have prepared for it? And that's much more important for us to be ready for that with our good deeds and correct belief. I want to go back to that, by the way, that correct belief is critical to have the right belief, the aqidah of the Salaf Asali. If without that aqidah, they will never make it. I don't care. And, and they can call themselves Salafi. They can call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, but without that correct belief and practice, it, it won't happen. Continue on with some questions for Sheikh Yusuf Estes and from our studio audience. The brother was asking, what's the best way when you're giving the invitation to leave a good lasting impression? One of the best things I can think of, and you referred to it earlier in the subject of the biryani, is you can take them to eat or offer to take them to eat or do something nice for them right here in this world because most of the people who are not Muslim are very attached to the gifts and things you give in this world. Whereas I'm, I'm much more impressed, for instance, if somebody makes dua for me and my family, I really like it, thank you so much for that. But other people would be like, okay, thanks for the prayers, uh, gain money. <laughs> so sometimes if you give them a little pamphlet, a brochure, a little booklet, maybe I've even given people money, you know, just tell them, you know, because they need help. A lot of times people need financial help. And you give somebody a $10 bill and you tell them a little bit about Islam and he say, well, thank you so much, whatever, and say, well, you know, you get a chance to help somebody else down the road. Because even if you say, well, they're a beggar, I'm not going to help them. No, just don't worry about it. You'll get a reward from Allah. Do your best. Giving gifts that is definitely a good thing to do. Uh, we had a, one of our guests, Dr. Sabi, on the show, and he mentioned a life story about a doctor giving gifts during Christmas. And uh, is this 
something where it would be acceptable the doctor, it's a true story, was giving gifts of wine to uh, his friends. We're not talking about gifts like this, are we? He gave away wine? Wine, yes. At Christmas? At Christmas. I can't speak on the behalf of a Muslim that might do that, but I could tell you that there are better things to give people than a headache. <laughs> I don't, uh, I, can't, I can't wrap my head around that idea. But definitely to be kind and generous with the people, but not just at Christmas. In fact, I would prefer it to be known that when I give something to somebody that I'm not trying to tie it into their religion. But I don't want to stop giving things. I don't want to have, well, we're not really on the subject, but some people ask me about like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter, things like this. I say, look, if you can be nice to somebody on one day more so than the other days, you need to work on yourself to be that level of good every day with your mom, your dad, your friends, or whatever. It's not about giving a gift on a birthday because every day that I can do something good for people, I want to do that. So I don't want to, I don't want to say it like just giving something at a certain time and forget about the wine. Halal <laughs> gifts. Yeah, uh, uh, even then, I want to be sure that it's not just a one-shot deal. It should be that whatever I'm doing, I should be conti uh, continuing it. I think our Prophet Sallallahu said what means that Allah loves what's done continually, even if something small, better than something big, but it's only done once. Okay, so that's it. And thank you for attending this uh, filming.